Good afternoon. I'm Patrick Lewis, the Director of Collections and Research at the Filson Historical Society. So glad that you joined us for today's presentation. A Celebrity in Kentucky During the War of 1812 with Carolyn Easton. This program is presented through the generous support of the National Endowment for the Humanities, and it's sustaining the humanities through the American Rescue Plan Initiative. With this support, the Filson will present a series of public programs and launch Resurrecting the First American West, a digital exhibit on the diverse Ohio Valley frontier. Carolyn Eastman is a professor of history at Virginia Commonwealth University. Her research focuses on the cultural and intellectual history of early America and the Atlantic world, political culture, gender, and the history of print, oral, and visual media. She's the author of the prize winning A Nation of Speechifiers, Making an American Public After the Revolution, and is currently a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellow at the New York Historical Society. I'll return to moderate questions after the presentation as time permits. Please join me in welcoming Carolyn Easton. Thank you so much. I hope you can see me all right. Um, I especially want to thank Patrick Lewis for inviting me today and Scott Scarborough for working out all the technical issues that make this possible. I have to say that when I was watching the little intro video and looking at your beautiful Filson lecture hall, I wish I were there right now because there's something so different about presenting public talks on Zoom that rather than in an actual room with actual people. And all of that matters for the talk I'm gonna be giving today because it's about a man who became a celebrity by being in rooms, giving talks to real people. Um, so I am especially glad to be speaking today to the um, supporters of the Filson because what I found when I was doing my research at the Filson was this really remarkable collection of papers that I didn't expect to find. And so I'm gonna be talking about that in just a second. What I'm gonna be doing here right now is first I'm gonna talk about the book as a whole, and then I'll get to the material on Kentucky in particular. So that's where I'm going. But first I'm gonna share my screen with you. All right, that should be good. Um, if my uh, image is in the way, by the way, you can just take your cursor and move it to a place where you can see properly. Um, so I wanted to begin with this image of the United States in the early 19th century, because it's not an image that a lot of us are familiar with. You know, um, I think when a lot of us think about the period right after the American Revolution, the period, you know, when the, uh, we call it the founding era, we often don't think about the fact that it was a deeply divided period of time. I mean, if you read the letters of the founders of the nation, they worry on a weekly basis about whether the United States could survive. I mean, this was a period when the United States was divided by region. You know, it took weeks to get from, say, Richmond, Virginia to Kentucky. Um, it was divided by politics. It was divided by religion, by social issues, by uh, racially. It was a, a deeply divided period. And I think that if you imagine that, in fact, most people in the United States had not traveled more than 100 miles from their home in their lifetime, you can start to imagine how different it could have been at a time when traveling was long and difficult, and it was really hard to imagine yourself being a part of a larger nation. In fact, I mean, what I like to say is that this was a period when the US was in the midst of invention. It was trying to figure out what it was gonna be. And into this environment came a celebrity, um, a celebrity who in a lot of ways had some of the sort of cliched hallmarks of celebrity that we think of today. I, he had um, uh, sort of eccentric clothing that he wore. He had a series of glamorous friends. He was prone to narcissism. Um, he even had a narcotics habit that I'll be talking about in a moment. 
And he also held quite scandalous views of religion. And yet, at the time, in the early 19th century, in fact, what he got himself started in 1808, this was a period when virtually all of the nation's important leaders in a variety of fields not only became his uh, patrons seeking to help his career, but they attended his lectures and supported him full, full heartedly. People like Thomas Jefferson, who was president of the United States when Ogilvy got started, um, John Quincy Adams, the novelist, uh, Washington Irving, um, the Benjamin Rush, the doctor, Henry Clay, the great Kentucky politician, Ralph Waldo Emerson, a series of elite and important women in the country, all of them thought that what Ogilvy was doing when he performed was crucially important to the country. And I know that in talking about Ogilvy as a celebrity, some of you may have been turned off by that notion. I mean, celebrity is, I think, one of the phenomena that we sometimes regret today. Um, we're all sick of talking about the Kardashians, or maybe we're not. Or, But I think that when you back up a little bit and you think about how uh, the people we admire most as talented, beautiful, fashionable, all of the, those kinds of appreciations can tell us a lot about ourselves. So, you know, whether I love Bruce Springsteen and you don't, those, those ostensibly, those, those fixations tell us a lot about who we are and who we care enough about to debate. And so what I see as being so interesting about James Ogilvie's career is that in fact, the, the national fixation with his talent, with his genius, as they called it, um, it holds up a mirror to the early 19th century US and allows us to see that culture really vividly. Uh, so, so in talking about Ogilvy as a celebrity, and of course he was talked about as a celebrity at the time, otherwise I wouldn't have used it, I really seek to show that what I'm focusing on is not necessarily just Ogilvy. I'm interested in looking at all the people in the US who loved him and appreciated his talent. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about what he did. On stage, he gave a series of lectures. Uh, his subjects included things like female education, gambling, dueling, suicide, subjects that I think today sound like sort of a motley array of things, but at the time in the early 19th century, these were matters of major public debate and discussion. And so what Ogilvy was doing on stage was taking a topic of crucial public interest and helping to helping his audiences think about it, think together as they sat together in a room and and thought about the, how this mattered to the United States. And I think what's interesting about this is that he very much wanted people to deliberate, to see all sides of an issue. He would, for example, in his suicide lecture, would actually speak quite sympathetically about the struggles that people who suffer from great pain or great depression experience. And, and he wanted his audiences to feel sympathy with those who might have suicidal ideation because simply to reject those feelings out of hand was a deeply unsympathetic kind of perspective to take. Now, public speaking, it was so much more important in the early 19th century than we think of it today. And I think that a lot of it had to do with what I opened speaking about. That is in a deeply divided United States, a United States in which many people, leaders included, feared that the US might not survive such a fragmentation, public speaking was seen as a, a medium of communication that might help tie the country together. 
And, you know, Americans were looking back to the classical republics of Greece and Rome. And when they looked at those models for how a republic, a democratic republic might survive, they saw people like Cicero and Demosthenes, major public speakers who were acting in the best interest of the public when they debated uh, their, their peers and sought to find the best path forward for their countries. And so a lot of people felt that, you know, when you looked at George Washington or Thomas Jefferson, some of the, the first presidents of the United States, they were terrible public speakers. And there was a concern that without their leaders being great speakers, the country might also collapse. And so what Ogilvy was doing when he brought people together to consider these important issues, he was modeling how eloquence itself might help the nation survive. He very much was advocating for oratory as a major medium of communication in the early 19th century. Okay. So one of the things I find so, so riveting about this topic is that when I was first doing my research, I had a hard time finding speeches that Ogilvy gave. I mean, nobody seemed to have collected them. He didn't have an archive. So hunting down things about Ogilvy meant just going every place where he traveled. But the descriptions of him are wonderful. So this one, he is tall, lean, and badly formed, his cheekbones high and prominent, his shoulders narrow and round. Indeed, his whole figure is rather ungraceful. But when he speaks, you forget his personal uh, defects. His eye, which is bright and quick, bespeaks the energy of his mind. It is the order then only that claims your attention and leads captive your every feeling. Or there's this one, by the novelist Washington Irving, a great friend and defender of Ogilvy's. Irving wrote, he was a pale, melancholy looking man with a meager, pallid countenance and an awkward and embarrassed manner. But when he spoke, the change in the whole man was wonderful. His form would acquire a quickness and grace. His long, pale visage would flash with a hectic uh, gleam. And I'm uh, sorry, I'm, I'm blocking out my own thing here. Um, and there were uh, there would be pathetic tones and deep modulations in his voice that delighted the ear and spoke to the heart. So all of this, I think, indicates the way that Ogilvy had a terrific and dynamic experience on stage that electri electrified his listeners. And I think that in a lot of ways, one of the things that I found most interesting about doing this project initially was that I was trying to study something we've lost. I was trying to study the ephemeral nature of performance. What was it like to watch this public speaker on stage? What was it like to experience his lectures that were so popular? Um, and what I found I, that I did the most of all was start looking at um, uh, guidebooks for public speaking to understand the ways that people were taught to perform public speech. And so, for example, in this one, this was a richly illustrated uh, volume. This one shows that it wasn't just the speaker's speech itself. It wasn't just the modulations of their voice or the way they varied their voice over the course of things. Speaking to be truly eloquent required a kind of elaborate and sometimes athletic series of gestures and postures, all of which helped to enact the eloquence that the speaker was delivering. And these are really wonderful. This is just a little a snippet of a guidebook that was showing people how to learn how to deliver a popular poem. And each of these postures would have been correlated to different feelings on stage, which would have meant that if you were in a building that was crowded with people and you were sitting in the back, you might not be able to hear because a lot of those buildings didn't have great acoustics, but you'd be able to see the speaker. You'd be able to see their eloquent and graceful movements on stage. It was a way to imagine how true eloquence, how a true United States might survive. This, this dynamic 
movement and energy that one had on stage could actually, you know, uh, give people goosebumps, could, could bring tears to their eyes. It's um, a wonderful thing. Now, this was no flash in the pan. Ogilvy was, he received raves about his performances. Uh, this was a, a letter that one Philadelphian wrote to another um, indicating how, per, how powerful the uh, performances were. And he's writing from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. He writes, I had thought that our immovable Germans would not readily enjoy an entertainment where there were, was neither stale decoration nor broad merriment, but such is the magic of genius that Mr. O has completely overcome these difficulties and carries away from Lancaster the most flattering success. The good people seem to enter perfectly into the spirit of the orator and are so ready to yield to his impressions that to use the, praise of, uh, the phrase of some of them, before they knew where they were, they found their hands up to their eyes. So Ogilvy traveled almost constantly. He was truly celebrated as a great and eloquent public speaker for about 13 years, 10 of which he spent in the United States, and two of those years he spent in Kentucky, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But I wanted to point you to this map because I think appreciating the ground that he covered during the course of his lecture career is very impressive. So if you watch the dots begin to appear, just know that each one of them represents at least five lectures that he gave over time. This tracks just the first few years of his performances, but as you can see, he began in Virginia, worked him his way up the East Coast, all the way into the District of Maine, as it was called then, and then slowly back down to New York City, and then up the Hudson River to Albany, and eventually to uh, uh, Montreal and Quebec in Lower Canada, ultimately down to South Carolina and Georgia, where he's spoken a number of different places. And then finally, in the fall of 1811, he left Columbia, uh, South Carolina on his horse at a walk because you could only ever walk your horse and headed toward Kentucky. He got to Lexington and began giving a number of lectures there. He um, found ultimately that Kentucky was a great place to give lectures. But just before I leave this map, I wanted to point to one more thing, which is that Kentucky was incredibly difficult to get to. I mean, as I said, it took Ogilvy walking his horse from Columbia almost a month to get to Lexington at the time. That was a long period to be on the road. And yet what he found when he got there was that news about his celebrity, about his talents had already reached Kentuckians. And so he filled his audiences to bursting. He was able to speak not just in the major towns at that time of Lexington and Frankfurt and Louisville, but he also gave a lot of talks in smaller areas, places like Bardstown and Winchester and Paris, um, small towns that allowed him to uh, practice his uh, public speaking and to continue to hone his talents. And the other thing I'll say about getting to Kentucky was that he also greeted a Kentucky culture that really prized oratory. Um, Henry Clay was one of the people he met immediately. Clay attended his talks and in fact, Clay thanked him for giving a major donation to a library in Lexington. And I mean, this was a moment when Henry Clay was Speaker of the House in Congress and was already becoming renowned as a speaker on his own. And so the interaction between the speakers like Ogilvy, who gave lectures for pay, and speakers like Henry Clay, who were paid to serve in Congress and debate their fellow politicians, that dyna dynamism was incredibly important at this time. Um, but it also shows that no matter how divided the nation at this time, no matter how far flung areas like 
Kentucky were from say a major center like Philadelphia, the topic of celebrity helped to bring people together. The topic of celebrity allowed people to see this great public speaker about whom they had already heard. They had already read accounts of his talents. And so they were able to compare their own expectations to what they saw in person. Okay, let me move on here. So at first, when Ogilvy arrived in Kentucky, he did what he had always done. He gave a series of talks throughout uh, all the major towns where he could get an in invitation. He started in Lexington and gave a series of talks both within the city and the sort of surrounding areas like Winchester and Paris. He continued on to Frankfurt and Louisville and so on. And one of the things that I think it's really worth pausing here to note is that you know, as you mentioned earlier, that I was not able to find a lot of the texts of the talks that he gave until I got to the Filson. One of the most amazing things about my time at the Filson was I, you know, I had gotten used to doing that kind of needle in a haystack searching. So I was calling up collections with anything that sounded like it might be interesting. And one of them was a collection under someone else's name that included a series of, of lecture notes. That's what the finding aid said. But when I opened it up and looked at the titles of the lecture notes and started to read through a handwriting that I knew really well to be Ogilvy's, I realized that these might not be attributed to him. They may not have his name on them, but these were Ogilvy's real speeches. And so one of the most amazing things, I think, in the course of my research was finding a series of his lecture notes that had been utterly unknown before. And I was able to know more clearly how he delivered his speeches. I'd read about them. I'd read a lot of rave reviews of them, but being at the Filson allowed me to actually see the speeches in the actual wording. It's wonderful. Now, there were two really unique things about Ogilvy's experience in Kentucky that really set Kentucky as apart from the other places where he spoke. And one of them was the fact that he, after speaking for several months in all the major cities and as well as minor cities, he actually stopped lecturing. He rented a cabin in a remote area of Chameleon Springs, which is uh, down maybe not too far from Bowling Green. And he, he simply set himself up in this cabin for uh, a few winter months because he wanted to break himself of an opium habit that he had developed over time. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that he had a narco narcotics habit. His, his disease was opium. And I want to pause to say that, you know, when, when we talk about opiates today, a major scourge in the United States, we are thinking of very specific kinds of drugs that have been very carefully developed to have strong effects on people. The opium that Ogilvy was taking was a little bit different and importantly different. He had probably started taking it to, because he had rheumatic pain. And, and yet what a lot of people discovered in the early 19th century when you were taking um, the form of laudanum, that was the, the form of opium that people took. Laudanum was a, a, a sort of a, a viscous uh, liquid in which people took um, wine and a little bit of raw opium that, you know, sort of straight out of the, the poppy seeds and uh, simmered it with spices to take away some of the bitterness of the opium and ultimately sort of develop it into this liquid and you would drop it by droplets into a, a glass of water or a glass of wine and drink it that way. Opium and especially laudanum was the only painkiller that people had available to them. But a number of people had begun, they probably began taking it to cure their pain, 
but they also began taking it because they realized that it actually made their minds sharper. And I think that o Ogilvy probably did it for both reasons. He discovered when he was a young school teacher in his early days after immigrating from Scotland to the US, that he needed a little extra energy to stay up at night. People in the early 19th century considered laudanum to be a kind of stimulant. It was a kind of early 19th century study drug that people took to sharpen their ideas, to give them a little more energy into a long evening so they can continue reading and thinking. And by the time Ogilvy got to Kentucky in 1811, though, he had developed a dangerous habit of taking too much laudanum. As with some other opiates, laudanum was something that uh, people often began taking to cure their pain or, again, recreationally, but discovered that they needed to take more and more of it over time to have the same effects. And if they tried to cut back on the amount of opium they took, they often experienced terrible pain. And so when Ogilvy got to Kentucky, and he'd been fantasizing about this for several months, he wanted to locate himself far from the public. He wanted to isolate himself from other people, and he wanted to be near a spring. And because in the sort of early 19th century notions of health and how you uh, regain your health after having an illness, uh, the idea was to drink as much water as you could. And you needed fresh spring water, not usually the kind of water that came out of wells, which was often contaminated. In fact, I mean, just as a quick sidebar, one of the reasons why so many people drank so much alcohol in the early 19th century was because the water wasn't safe to drink. Anyway, so Ogilvy rented this cabin uh, um, deep in the middle of nowhere. And then he started writing letters about his sense of real triumph, that he was able to go, go cold turkey on the opium. He was able to exercise every day by climbing the hills nearby. And he was able to drink this fresh spring water, which he credited as helping to sort of flush his system of the, the toxins of the opium habit. He emerged from Chameleon Springs in the spring of 1812, utterly refreshed. He felt like he was a new man. And he felt especially inspired that he'd been able to do this based on his own sheer strength of will. In fact, he wrote a really wonderful letter describing the, the will, the willpower it took to throw the vial of laudanum out the window and see it crack and dissolve and, and never again go back to it. So Chameleon Springs, a little known area, and yet it has its own uh, historical marker. So the first interesting thing I think about Ogilvy's experience in Kentucky was that he went there to, you know, kind of dry out, that he went there to get himself off of this um, uh, narcotics habit. And I've been careful to use the term habit or, or maybe to call him a habitué of, of opium, because I think one of the things that I found so interesting is that no one knew that opium was addictive. In fact, they didn't use the word addictive or addiction until the very end of Ogilvy's life. And what's so interesting about that, I think, is that you know, we have gotten so used to seeing addiction as a particularly lamentable kind of um, state to be in that we have a hard time imagining a period when a major drug, a, a drug that was cheap and readily available to anyone could, uh, was out there and people only anecdotally had known that that O opium could be addictive. And so one of the things I talk about quite a bit in the book is the notion of how people understood opium at that time and how uh, Ogilvy saw a way for him himself to get off of it. Um, unfortunately, this was not the end of his, um, his 
habitual use of opium, but it was a, a really vivid time when he felt it was especially important to rid himself of this habit and regain his own health. The second thing about Ogilvy's Kentucky experience that was so interesting is that when he got back to uh, Lexington at the end of his three month period out in, uh, in Chameleon Springs, he spoke a great deal about the importance of regaining and re-delivering new lectures that he had rewritten. He had revitalized his entire lecture career. And so as a result of weaning himself off of the opium and regaining this healthy sort of um, lifestyle habit by you know, hiking the hills nearby, he felt reborn. He even said, uh, constituted as I am to enjoy any degree of happiness, even to avert intolerable misery, misery I must be intensely active. This activity can only be exerted and kept alive by powerful motives. Um, when he came back from Chameleon Springs, he realized that the the, ti the the times had changed in Lexington and elsewhere in Kentucky because by the spring of 1812, people were already beginning to beat the drums of war against the British. And now you have to realize that the, the War of 1812 and the kinds of activities that the British were engaging in during the spring of 1812, uh, just before war was officially declared, made Kentuckians almost more angry than any other American. What's so interesting is that the War of 1812 um, ended with Americans feeling much closer together, but when it began, it only highlighted the divisions within the country. Divisions between the two political parties, the Federalists and the Republicans, divisions over region. Um, so, you know, people in Baltimore felt very differently than people in New England. Many people thought that war was ridiculous and a terrible idea. And there were even people who talked about seceding from the United States because of their anger, but Kentuckians were absolutely in support of war. They were outraged at the kinds of things that uh, Great Britain had engaged in, and they felt very strongly that uh, they wanted to support the War of 1812. Ogilvy, meanwhile, having come back after you know, getting into shape and uh, ridding himself of his um, opium habit, found this invigorating. He found the, the war talk and the patriotism to be absolutely intoxicating. And so in fact, I think what's interesting here is that he wound up buying into the kinds of patriotic and often Indian hating rhetoric of a lot of the people he was surrounded by. People had very mixed ideas about um, the British, but they certainly hated the Native American tribes who lived nearby. And Ogilvy got caught up in that. And so sure enough, by the end of the summer, by September 1st of 1812, Ogilvy got so inspired and felt so strongly that even as an immigrant, he wanted to support his adopted country that he enlisted in the militia. He bought a musket, he bought a pair of guns, and he uh, enlisted for a full month, which was significantly longer even than the captain of his militia uh, uh, company. Uh, his captain only enlisted for 10 days. I think it's an indication of how a lot of Kentuckians really believed that the war would be over very quickly. And so Ogilvy enlisted for a month, dedicated to the cause. He ultimately re-enlisted and spent the entire fall um, off in the Illinois and Il uh, Indiana territories um, looking to, um, to fight the British and their Native American allies. They did not succeed. Um, I think that there's a there's a really interesting story about the uh, Kentucky experience during the War of 1812, but I think for most of that, I'm going to actually ask you to read the book because it's a it's a great story. Okay, the one thing he did do, though, was 
uh, find that one of his greatest talents as a member of the militia was inspiring the troops. And so he gave a couple of speeches to the troops out in the Illinois and Indiana territories. And then when he returned to Lexington in the winter of 1813, he repeated them to local audiences. So he felt very strongly that he had had this kind of um, an inspirational effect on his, um, his fellow soldiers out in this miserable uh, region where they had often really run into trouble, you know, even having enough food to feed their horses and themselves. Uh, it was a, a tough period. Oh, <laughs> we got there a little sooner than I thought. I'll go back up. Okay, so I'm going to start to wrap things up now. And I wanted to, um, most of all, sort of repeat something that I started with at the beginning, which was, I mean, this is, this is a story about a celebrity who no one has heard of. I often describe Ogilvy as the greatest early American celebrity you've never heard of. And I think that there's a longer story here about how he was forgotten and why he was forgotten. A story that I think can also tell us a lot about the way that celebrity has come to, to be in part because of Ogilvy's experience, a, a kind of phenomenon that we often move through, you know, we often become disillusioned with our celebrity, um, the people we are the greatest fans for, maybe they, they make a misstep in public or they start to spout political views that we disapprove of, um, or they say something racist in public. There's a lot of reasons why we become disillusioned with our, with our celebrities. But I think in Ogilvy's case, what's so interesting about this was that he was a celebrity during a period when there were very few celebrities. They, they didn't have the kind of celebrity culture that we recognize today. You know, there was no paparazzi. There were no gossip magazines. You know, he was, he was raised to the level of celebrity in part by his friends and patrons and in part by the press. And so I think that looking at his experience is very interesting on its own, but for me, what's most important about it is that it tells us about the United States at this key moment, this key moment when the US really was in the midst of invention. Americans were trying to figure out who they were and how they related to one another. And having this, this vivid and eccentric and dynamic public speaker come through town was one way for people to get excited. So what I wanted to do in writing this book was first of all, to write a book that was, um, that was enjoyable to read. Um, I think that a lot of academics struggle with um, that, but I really wanted to write a book that people like my parents would enjoy reading. And, and in doing that, I wanted to bring alive the story of this early United States when the United States was so divided because I thought it would allow people to appreciate how different and interesting that period is. I also wanted to have a bunch of surprises in the book. I mean, there's, there's a really interesting set of stories about the nature of stage performance, the, the just what Ogilvy wore when he was on stage, the kinds of scandals he provoked during his career, all of those things I think make for a very interesting narrative uh, that again, allows you to see a very different kind of early United States than what a lot of us were educated to understand. I mean, Ogilvy and his audiences, all of them, focused on a vision of the future of the United States in a time of great division, a great fragmentation that allowed them to think about how the United States could become something better. There, that there were ways that the United States could sort of gather together and people would feel less divided and less fragmented. And Ogilvy's career really helped to do that on some level eloquence, focusing on eloquence as a kind of a, 
mode of communication that could help enhance that togetherness, I think uh, really does allow us to see the eagerness with which many people felt it was necessary for the United States to gather together. And so in writing the book, what I wanted readers to see was how much Ogilvy's story wasn't, it wasn't just the story of an outlier or a, a particularly weird character in early America, but actually this story is all about what the United, what was going on in the United States at that moment. And so in the end, what I wanted to do was tell a different story about deep division within the country before the advent of a modern celebrity culture and, and yet still during an era when all Americans could gather together in a place, in a room and discuss and debate and think together about the issues that were the most important to their culture. So I wanted to focus on, um, sure, a, a kind of lightning rod of a celebrity figure, but to show that he was a central figure to the United States at this moment of invention. And then finally, um, I wanted to say that um, the book is on sale. <laughs> so the press, if you go to uncpress.org, the press is having a 40% off sale of all of its books. And in the case of mine, if you use this code 01DAH40, you get 40% off, which brings the total cost of the book down to about $18. So it's, it's worth going through the press website for that. Anyway, thank you so much. And I really hope that you can stick around and uh, engage in the, the Q&A here as well. So I'll stop sharing. Well, thank you so much. That was incredibly uh, entertaining in the spirit of fantastic oratory. Um, <laughs> I would point out for everybody that we do have the links uh, to buy the book uh, in our chat. Um, so as you're thinking of your questions and you're wanting to put those in there, uh, make sure you go and, uh, and click those links and get the full story. Um, and we've already got uh, a really fantastic question again about the experience of going to one of these uh, lectures and more specifically, what happens afterwards? Does he, does he interact? Um, with his fans, does he does he sign autographs? Does he does he do like a Q and A afterwards, or what what's that experience like on lecture night? I love that question. So so first of all, you know what? I don't know. I watch a lot of sort of masterpiece theater types of uh, period dramas, and um, Ogilvy's experience in a room looked very different. The kinds of theaters where you know, that you can imagine with sloping seats, with upholstered chairs, with maybe galleries to the side. He never spoke in rooms like that. Instead, he tended to speak in the large public meeting spaces that were parts of taverns or, or hotels. So they would often simply line the room with benches. So they had a whole bunch of benches going back because those rooms were used for dances, they were used for other kinds of gatherings, and you wanted to have some kind of seating that could be easily pushed aside, you know. So he was speaking just in a room, he would build a stage at the front of the room um, that was about two feet high so that everyone could see him gesturing and so on. Um, so he would give his lecture and at the end of the lecture, his ads often said, if Mr. O is not, too much exhausted by giving a lecture, he would then give these um, declamations of popular poetry. And so he would sort of act out, you know, the, the most beloved poetry of the time, or maybe speeches from Shakespeare. And those were just as popular. And in fact, um, you asked about whether he stuck around afterward and um, and signed autographs or engaged with his uh, listeners. Um, I don't know about that, but I do know that in order for him to begin a series of talks in any given town, what he often did was he would arrive two weeks early because he had to find a place to stay. He had to find a place where he could give his talks. He had to make friends with people so that they might come. So he actually spent a lot of time whining and dining 
um, the most important people he could meet in an, any given town. So he might introduce himself to the local minister, for example, and the minister would then, once he approved of Ogilvy's morality or once he approved of his, um, the subject matter he was gonna be speaking on, the minister would then tell everyone he knew that, well, this guy seems great, you know, or, um, or Ogilvy might go to the parlor of an important uh, matron in the city and meet her and, and talk about uh, poetry and other issues as she and her daughters and her friends maybe worked with their needles. And so um, a lot of what he did was schmoozing. He needed to meet the important people in a town, prove himself to be worthy of, of their attention and you know they were they were buying tickets for a dollar. Um, it's it's always hard to uh, estimate how much a dollar is worth in modern money, but um, but a dollar was what a working man made in a day. I mean, a dollar was a lot of money. And so these were he wanted to make sure that people knew what they were getting. Well, and and then presumably then the next stage on, hoping to leverage those connections into I'm sure a letter of introduction into the next town or maybe suggestions of which is the next town, especially as you get further and further west. Where do I go next? Yes, exactly. Who should I meet? Who can help me? Who can, um, how, who can be a patron? Because you can imagine that if he was able to win over um, an influential woman in one town, she might write to all her cousins in the next town up the road and tell them what a, what a nice man he was and so on. Well, and, and, you know, I especially enjoyed watching the dots uh, plot into the map um, uh, earlier in the lecture because, and again, sort of knowing what we do of, of commercial networks in that time, you know, those are the same roads and rivers upon which, you know, any sort of commercial goods are moving. And of course, it makes sense that as he's moving along these, these influence networks, then those are the, the places that he's going to end up. That's right. That's right. And, you know, I was thinking as well, um, you know, talking about this, this experience of, uh, of the United States and particularly the West and, and focusing on Kentucky at this time um, and trying to give a, a slice of what um, that, that feels like, you know, this does seem to be um, representative of the ways that national and international Atlantic culture are present here at a moment in Kentucky that has, you know, really been, you know, under white uh, settlement for maybe, uh, you know, what, 30 years at this point. Um, and so it speaks to this, this yearning for uh, this type of, of uh, international achievement and status um, in, in a town like Lexington that, that was and is always international status, obsessed <laughs> especially. Yeah. But I wonder if you could talk about the ways that he sort of, you know, brings uh, that, that sort of touch and, and, um, uh, and I don't know, and, and sort of certifies these places as part of this, this international community. Yeah, I mean, you can imagine if, um, I mean, I think a, a lot of Kentuckians were really proud of their cities, of their culture, you know, at the time. But when they had a major celebrity like Ogilvy come through, through town, they knew that they had sort of arrived, you know, that he brought with him an incredible cosmopolitanism that a lot of them sort of hungered for. And so, I mean, one of the things that was so delightful in doing research in Kentucky was finding letters and diaries of people who had gone to his talks saying he was just, you know, breathtaking. He was just uh, everything I'd heard from the, the newspaper reports. We've got a really fantastic uh, audience question that's just come in here about the content of his talks on women. Um, you know, what is he advocating for? Uh, is he talking about marriage rights? Is he talking about voting? What are what are his his opinions? Yeah, it's um, definitely a period when it's it was too early to talk about women voting. <laughs> it's just, I mean, the sad fact of the matter is that no one was talking about that. But one of the biggest uh, debates of the day was whether women should be educated in the same way as men, whether they should get some kind of um, separate but equal education to use an anachronism, or if they should be educated only so to become good Christians, to uh, develop certain kinds of um, maybe ar artistic talents and 
speaking French and doing needlework and doing painting and that kind of thing. And Ogilvy argued very strongly for something approaching an equal education. He never wanted to alienate his listeners. He always wanted to appeal to them on some level because after all, he was trying to earn a living based on their ticket price, their ticket uh, payments. But he did argue strongly for women having an equal education. And what that meant often was that he befriended a number of very well-educated and influential women around the country who then could sort of use their friendship with him to continue to advocate for better educations for their daughters. And so um, in a lot of his lectures, he, he tried to maintain a certain kind of um, agnosticism about exactly what he was arguing, but not in the case of female education. He felt very strongly about it. Um, so he was no firebrand, exactly. He was no Mary Wollstonecraft, but he was nevertheless um, a very influential um, voice in this, in this new effort. We've got a couple of questions uh, about his, his life after leaving Kentucky. Uh, one related to this, does he ever marry himself? And then what ultimately happens to him? Yeah, on the question of marriage, he actually was married relatively early on. He was married when he was about, about 30. Um, and this was when he was working as a school teacher in Richmond, Virginia, and um, starting to give public speeches because he had he begun to realize that he had a talent for it. Um, but unfortunately, his wife died after just a little bit more than a year of marriage. And, you know, one of the shocking things about doing research on his life is that I have almost no information about her. I have no information about their courtship. Um, I've never seen her sign a document. Um, but a lot of that is to be expected in that that part of central Virginia where I was looking around Richmond and, and that area, during the Civil War, there were so many battles that took place that a lot of the documents just got burned or they got destroyed. And so I know more about Ogilvy's opium habit than I do about his marriage. And after that, after his wife died, um, he was heartbroken and never married again. In fact, I've never seen a single indication that even when he was spending a lot of time visiting women in their parlors, nobody gossiped about him behaving himself incorrectly or flirting with a woman. I never heard any indication about another courtship. And so he, he wound up dying a widower um, at the end of his life. Um, and, and then the first part of your question was, um, what happened after he left Kentucky? Uh, so there, there are two things that I wanted to say. One that is strange and great is that while he was in Kentucky, he wound up inspiring some imitators to start imitating what he did. And so I started seeing more and more ads both in Kentucky and elsewhere of other men who gave the same kinds of lectures, the same kinds of subjects, the same kinds of uh, performances, but for a cut rate. They, they were only charging 50 cents instead of a dollar that Ogilvy was charging. And so he began to have these other people who sort of followed him around and tried to you know, earn a living in the same way. The other thing was that he, he wound up spending Let's see, he left Kentucky in 1813 and for the next three and a half years uh, continued to do what he was doing. Um, and then ultimately in 1817, he left the US and traveled to Great Britain to continue his lecture career and try to build up his celebrity there. Um, he gave a, dozens and dozens of talks in England and Scotland, especially he ultimately intended to go to Ireland but never made it. Um, and never realized the same kind of celebrity that he had in the U.S. His, his U.S. celebrity was something unique. That's actually something that I was, I was thinking about um, as you were presenting. Uh, you know, is there something about the, the sort of the intellectual and political culture of the United States that, that makes him more successful than he would have been, say, remaining in Great Britain? That's really fascinating. Yeah, 
I mean, this is a great question, right? Um, and it's something that ultimately I think has to do with the fact that the US was trying to become a republic in the same way that the republics of Greece and Rome had survived and thrived. And I think that, you know, Great Britain had terrific public speakers. The parliament was full of them. There were all kinds of sort of um, uh, recreational speakers you could go see, people talking about science or the law or whatever. Um, Great Britain was deeply proud of its talent for oratory. And so you would think that they would welcome somebody like Ogilvy, who is, you know, continuing to enhance that reputation. But I think that the big difference is that the UK wasn't trying to be a republic. And the US was aspiring to something that it felt like might not work out. And so I think it was the very divisions and fragmentations of the US that enhanced people's attention to him as a celebrity, but especially because he was a celebrity who was talented at public speaking in a way that, you know, very few were. Well, and, and I think too, you know, just thinking about the ways that that enlightenment culture is being transplanted here into Kentucky at the time. And obviously you get, you know, educational institutions like Transylvania, but you're also seeing, you know, the influence of all these, these Scottish trained doctors who are coming over and bringing enlightenment medicine, which is which is sort of akin to enlightenment political thought. And there really is this, this self-conscious connection uh, between those those two countries and the sharing of these these Republican values that can bloom here. That's exactly right. Um, well and I, I I was reflecting too about this this international phenomenon of celebrity. And you know I've I've heard uh, you know, some people say that Lord Byron is is the first celebrity, or maybe it's Bo Brummel, uh, maybe it's Ogilvy. Who knows? Um, you know, but it one way or the other, somewhere in the Anglo sphere, uh, this concept of celebrity emerges at this time, um, and that again, that's probably due to the spread of print culture, maybe the flourishing of Republican ideas. What's in the what's in the Atlantic water right now? Uh, yeah, and you know, there are even scholars who've traced celebrity further back than that, you know, to the 17th century or the early 18th century. And so, yeah, there are a lot of people working on this subject at the moment. I do think that having a particular kind of density of print culture is crucial to celebrity. And I mean, let's face it, London was way ahead of any place in the US. London did have gossip magazines. They did have, I mean, Byron, of course, he was a, a beautiful man. He was a Lord, um, but he also um, sort of fostered this enormous culture of people creating prints of his face, his beautiful face. And so they were able to have a print of his face and his beautiful poetry right next to it. And so it didn't matter how many um, sexual peccadilloes he got himself into, how many scandals he became a part of, people could still really admire him as a writer, a thinker, and a beautiful person. And so in a lot of ways you see I understand why people say that Byron was one of the first celebrities because there was just an intensity of print culture surrounding him. So, yeah, I mean, and people have said the same about um, actors in France, mm -hmm. in Italy and other places. So yeah, this was, this was certainly a great heady period of the creation of celebrity. Well, and I, I, was, I was reflecting too on some of the newspaper clippings that you showed Celebrity is a thing that you possess. It's not in the way that it was used in that context, a thing that you are. And maybe that's a maybe that's a distinction that's starting to blur between a phenomenon surrounding you into just you. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, yeah, it's it's used slightly differently. So yeah, that people will say that um, he's a celebrated orator or um, he's achieved great celebrity, um, but they never called him a celebrity per se. That was a, a kind of a locution that really didn't come about until the 1840s or so. Fascinating. Well, um, Carolyn Eastman, thank you so much. Um, again, we've got links to the book in the chat. I encourage everyone to, to go out and purchase it um, and to come. Uh, to the Pilsen and, uh, and look at those lecture notes.
Um, and, uh, and I know in the spirit of, of promoting our, our NEH program uh, and the First American West, where we're digitizing primary sources and adding to uh, an exhibit that we put up in the late 1990s, um, I think we'll have to, uh, to get some, uh, some collection information from you and maybe uh, scan a lecture or two and have that available to the public uh, by the end of this year. Thank you so much. I've loved speaking to you today. We've really enjoyed it. Thanks, everybody, and have a great afternoon.